Thank you so much. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, ambient occlusion is kind of like one hack that works really well, is not super related to physics, but let's th just dive into it right away. So this was like um, my final topic throughout my PhD, worked in collaboration with Meta throughout my internship. Um, so let's talk about AO for a bit. So this is just a render of one of the test scenes we have been using. And this is just using standard shading. There's nothing else applied to it, no like shadows and stuff. Oh, Ugh, it's auto advancing, sorry. Uh, I'll just deal with it. Um, essentially, um, you have this uh, image without any shadows, no direct shadows, no indirect shadows, and once you add ambient occlusion to it, the sense of depth um, is much more immersive, and it's essentially just a metric or a measure of how occluded each surface is on average. Now, this topic is about split rendering in context of ambient occlusion, so let's talk a bit about uh, split rendering to contextualize our work. In modern real-time graphics, you nowadays have at least millions of triangles, but for high-end systems, you have billions of them. So in addition to that, you also have expensive and complex effects, and these include like global illumination, reflections, volumetrics, and all of that is happening at a very high refresh rate and resolution. So if you think about it, running something like Lumen or Nanite in Unreal Engine 5 at full fidelity on like weaker devices such as phones or standalone AR VR headsets is not really feasible. And this is where we start talking a bit about split rendering. So splitting up the workload of the render to make um, the computation on the weaker device is somewhat manageable, but still utilizing the hardware to its maximum effect. Now, imagine you have a server that's running at like 20 frames a second. Could be a bit lower, could be a bit higher. Now, the server prepares a split rendering representation. So this can consist of geometry, textures, buffers, or anything else. Could also be points. And it sends this representation, usually via some compression or encoding, to a client. This could be a phone, this could be like a weak edge device connected to your TV, could be a standalone VR headset. And what this client does is it has its own kind of somewhat weak chip, but that does very rudimentary standard graphics things, and it can do decode, render, and composition things. And it does this to render autonomously, and it just sends back transforms and scene updates to the server so that the server knows exactly how to prepare the split rendering representation. So for split rendering, both the server and the client contribute to the final image by utilizing simple graphics operations and the suitable split rendering representation. Now, there are different ways of representing the data. So you could, for example, just use voxels, or so like a dense 3D grid of points, for example. Um, can be very efficient, especially to look up if you use 3D textures, but can also be memory intensive. You could use probes, as is commonly done for global illumination. Like, this could also be a suitable representation for streaming and splitting up the render workload, um, especially for like low-frequency things, like um, lighting using spherical harmonics. Um, the thing that I'm going to be talking about a bit, because we are also going to be comparing about it, and because it gained some popularity in recent years, is uh, texture-based representations uh, that essentially try to map a consistent representation of the surface into like a texture. So texture-based shading, just to give a brief overview, is a consistent mapping from an object surface into a 2D texture. And once we have that, we can compute pretty much any surface material function inside this texture space, for example, the full shading. And then we have this kind of texture cache. And once we have that, the client can autonomously use this information to render new views. So we have effectively decoupled the shading and the display stage between a server and the client. So there are some limitations to texture-based shading, and this is kind of the core of the motivation for this work for us. Um, so texture-based shading, in particular, many of these geometry-based methods, like shading atlas streaming, um, they are very sensitive to the underlying geometry of your meshes or your scenes. And sometimes, for example, uh, with shading atlas streaming, you pack these groups of two triangles each into rectangular blocks. And as the example here illustrates, if you have very non-uniform triangles, this will end up leading to distortion of samples on the object surface. So this is something we do not want, and it also includes like expensive pre-processing passes, so it's kind of a hassle to deal with. Now, what about points or circles? So recently, circles have gotten increasingly popular again, for example, for real-time diffuse global illumination. There's this amazing SIGGRAPH21 talk by EA Seed's team, um, about global illumination based on circles, where they just distribute a bunch of circles in the scene, scale them dynamically, and adjust the workload based on how far or close things are to the camera. 
Um, actually, like point-based global illumination has been really popular for a long time in the offline rendering space, but not necessarily in real-time spaces. Uh, but some of the advantages of it are that we can completely decouple these points or circles from the geometry, and we have the possibility of adaptively spacing and sizing them. And this gets us to our point-based split ambient occlusion pipeline. So again, we have our server. Um, we have a point generation system, so we initially generate a bunch of points in the scene. So this is just an overview of the pipeline, more on these individual things later. Then the server runs at, again, at a lower decoupled frame rate. It does some memory management on the GPU. It does some update and rendering of the points, and it prepares all of these points for networking for the client. Then we have our point representation, which in our case is a hash grid. So we have a hash table that maps a 3D grid for each mesh instance towards uh, a virtual cell data array. So this is uh, very efficient to look up, but also stores, uh, saves memory compared to like, using a dense grid. And the client, client then receives this point representation and can then render autonomously at whatever frame rate it wants to produce the AO reconstruction, so a final AO buffer that it can then composite on top of the color information of the scene. Now let's dive into some of these individual blocks a bit deeper. So for our point generation system, we first spawn points fully randomly on object surfaces. Um, we do this on the GPU, so it's quite fast. And we keep the point, point density consistent on average. So we just have a scaling factor that, that decides how many points we want to use per unit area. And we also take double-sided materials and mask materials into account so that we don't spawn points there. And to prevent points uh, from clustering on top of each other, we use Poisson disk rejection to make sure that they are very uniformly spaced. So here's an example of just using the uniform point distribution where you can see that points are clumped up together. And with the Poisson disk rejection, uh, the points are much more evenly spread across the surfaces. So here the points are visualized as these uh, white quads on the surfaces. Then for the server task, for the first one that's happening every server frame, we first determine course visibility. We use an extended field of view as a standard for these kind of split rendering systems to determine which points are visible. Then we determine the new point positions using, for example, the updated skinning matrices and new transforms that we get from the client. Then we ray trace all of the visible points to determine their ambient occlusion value. So for example here, if we have the frame N and some sort of mesh, we just do ray tracing for each point. This is quite expensive on the server, but nowadays with modern ray tracing hardware, this is kind of feasible. Then we uh, quantize and encode the position of each point and normal and the AO value such that everything fits into 32-bit. Um, this doesn't really affect the quality from our experiments. Uh, it can probably go quite a bit lower, um, but uh, this is up to future work. And importantly, if any of these values change, so if any position of the point changes or the normal or the AO value, we mark it as dirty for the subsequent memory management and networking passes. So let's get to the memory management. So again, we have this kind of 3D grid for each mesh instance. And, and how we get to our actual point cell information is that we hash the coordinate of the grid cell, which gives us a hash bucket. And this hash bucket has a point cell offset into like a large buffer of point cells. And it also has a physical cell ID, so not a virtual one, that we basically just perform a linear search over to find exactly which bucket we have in case there are multiple cells hitting the same hash bucket. Once we have this offset, we basically just go into a large linear array containing a bunch of cells, and each cell simply has seven points and some additional bookkeeping data that follow exactly this point data structure. So all of that is very tightly packed, and the uh, lookup is quite fast on server and client. Now let's uh, get some to some examples if you want to add or remove or update cells. So for example, here we have this cell at location X, Y, and Z with four points in them. If we want to add a new cell, we first find the first free hash bucket um, by just looking linearly over the hash table and seeing which one is free. Then we figure out the, a new offset in the point cell data structure where we allocate a new cell. Um, this cell then contains the information of all the points within it, and then we send this hash bucket and the point cell as an update to the client. The next thing is if we want to remove a cell, for example, if all of the points within a cell have been uh, removed. And in this case, we just look up at where exactly we are in the hash bucket and just clear the entry and send an update to the client. And the final thing we can do is we can update points. So if, for example, another mesh moves on top of these points such that their AO contribution is a bit darker, 
Um, we do exactly the same thing. So we follow the hash table. We find the bucket that corresponds to this uh, cell. We find the cell and we update all of these entries within it. And for the client, we simply send the full point cell. Uh, in our experiments, sending the full cell um, is actually slightly more data efficient compared to sending individual points, but it depends on how many points you store within cells. Now, in terms of networking on compression, um, all dirty point cells and hash buckets are delta encoded and compressed via off-the-shelf compression, such, such as LZ4 or Z standard. And the client data representation stays consistent with the server representation. So both of them use the same data structures, and we just compress them and send them to the client as is. Now let's come to the interesting part in terms of performance on the client. Um, during rendering on the client, we query the hash grid of the current surface fragment. So this is exactly the same thing we do on the server to figure out which kind of hash bucket we land into and what kind of, uh, in which kind of cell we are and how many points are in there. But only using a single grid cell would introduce block sampling artifacts. So um, we actually use a 2x2x2 two by two by two neighborhood of cells and we blend the contribution of these cells based on the distance, position, and normal. So if the normals deviate too much, we don't use these points, and similarly for like distance and position. And then once we do that, we end up with our final AO buffer on the client that we can then composite on top of the color image. Now let's get to our evaluation. So we have three test scenes with two camera paths each. Um, each uh, camera path is 15 seconds at 60 hertz. And we compare a ver variety of quality metrics, so uh, like PSNR, LPIPS, and FLIP, when compositing our AO that is rendered at 1080p on top of a four times super sampled shaded reference. So our color buffer is four times super sampled, and we compare the AO contribution of different methods uh, compared to a reference that is just brute force ray traced with 512 samples. And then we measure the network bandwidth in split rendering and streaming mode for uh, approaches that can be split. And we compare against Shading Atlas streaming, which is a texture space shading variant, and against uh, screen space ambient occlusion, which cannot be split up, but we can just compare against it in terms of performance and quality. Now let's get to some numbers. So here, uh, SAS32 uh, and SAS8 denote two different configuration of Shading Atlas streaming, where the 32 version is uh, a bit larger and doesn't constrain its texture space layout that much and the PSAO variants, the increasing numbers mean how many points on average we have. So larger numbers mean more points distributed in the scene. And SSAO is screen space ambient occlusion. So if we uh, look at the quality metrics, um, it's not um, our point space ambient occlusion, uh, point based split ambient occlusion um, achieves the best quality compared to the other approaches. Uh, mostly SSAO doesn't deal that well with large uh, large distance ambient occlusion, so it tends to produce uh, halos there. And our Shading Atlas streaming system struggles with the fixed shading budget that we employ in this evaluation, so it tends to overly blur uh, the AO contribution, which hurts its performance numbers. Now, more interestingly are the bandwidth numbers. So here we have the network bandwidth required in megabits per second. For all of these evaluations, the server was running at 30 frames a second. So if we compare like the medium configuration of our point-based split ambient occlusion versus the large configuration of shading atlas streaming, we can see that we outperformed the, uh, them in terms of quality by quite a substantial amount, even though we save much, uh, quite a substantial amount on bandwidth as well. And this even follows through to our lowest configuration or lowest quality configuration of our point structure, where we save even more in bandwidth, but in terms of flip and LPIPS metrics, we even still beat the shading atlas streaming system. So here's uh, a video of a point-based approach. Uh, you can see it handles like animations quite well, and uh, there's no like flickering artifacts going on. Everything is like temporarily coherent. There's some blotchiness going on that can be tweaked based on the amount of points that you are actually using in the scene. But overall, it matches the result or the quality of the ray traced reference quite well. In terms of performance, on our test system, performing the hash lookups for a single 1080p frame takes around 0.5 milliseconds on average. And this does not significantly change with larger point clouds as roughly a consistent number of points are sampled on average on the client. And in contrast to that, uh, screen space ambient occlusion on the same system requires around 0.2 or 0.3 milliseconds per frame. This is without a depth or normal prepass, which can or cannot increase the overhead if you don't have that in your engine. But overall, the sampling, the raw, raw sampling of our method on the client is comparable to SSAO in terms of uh, order of magnitude.
Shading Atlas streaming only requires a single bilinear texture fetch per fragment, which is pretty much as fast as you can get for like a split rendering system. But this obviously doesn't account for like the decoding and all of the networking overhead that this uh, texture space representation has. So in terms of limitations, uh, we currently only do static point generation. And future work could dynamically allocate and deallocate points based on demand or compute constraints. Additionally, our update heuristic is currently quite simple and operates on a per point basis. So as I've talked about, uh, the server just ray traces all of the points and figures out which values have changed, which is quite expensive on the server, of course. So considering mesh bounds instead could help with server performance and scalability. And we currently also do not use any explicit countermeasures against AO leaking, uh, which is a common artifact you see with like point-based methods or sort of serval-based methods. So in practice, a sufficiently dense point distribution kept these artifacts at a minimum for us. Uh, but with additional compute headroom, you could use highly compressed coarse depth estimates for uh, remedy of leaking by doing simple depth tests. Now we've shown a point-based split ambient occlusion a point-based split rendering system for ambient occlusion that outperforms other split rendering systems at costs comparable to per-frame screen space approaches. And this demonstrates that points could be an attractive data representation for decoupling of rendering tasks going forward, especially given that we now have hardware to ray trace these points, which was quite a bit more expensive previously. Now to conclude, uh, here is a QR code that leads you to the eventual code release. Currently this will lead you to a 404 because we haven't made it public yet, but hopefully we can do that soon. And before we go to Q&A, um, shameless plug, I'm currently a research scientist at Luma AI. We're hiring, so if you're interested in the new generation of 3D tools and 3D generative tools and nerfs and things like that, feel free to reach out to me or join um, or visit our join link. And with that, I'm happy to take any and all of your questions you might have. And we have the throwable mic again. Uh, good talk, thank you. Um, given that you're doing um, like a final gather style ray trace on this servo, is there any reason you didn't look into like a GI type thing, like over AO, like you could go and grab the colors from the from the ends of those rays. Yeah, essentially, uh, I think this could extend quite well to GI as well, especially like to the low frequency components of it. Initially, we were planning on doing that, but kind of like wanted to keep the focus on being more simple. Like I think you can extend it. It's mostly about figuring out how to efficiently compress it in that sense. Like most of the gains that we have here is because AO is just so good or so easily compressible. Um, if you have like more complicated information, like full colors, you might want to have like a different compression scheme, or maybe pack things into like an MPEG texture or something. But there's no reason why that shouldn't work if you figure out some smart representation of doing that. Cool, thank you. Yeah, I wonder what the um, performance implications for <laughs> dynamic geometry are, like when you have to recompute the Poisson points and so on. Um, yeah, so currently the, the point generation, which is like the biggest limitation, this is currently static. Um, I feel like, f so we do have like skinned animations in there, and for those currently we just allocate an additional headroom of points that can move around and deallocate de and allocate. If you want to do the point generation on the fly, I think the Poisson generation is quite a bit too expensive, but I'm pretty sure you can get really close with just some clever hur heuristics and doing it on a GPU. More questions? Okay, I'm gonna close with the last one then. Um, oh, was there another? Yeah, oh, we're there. Test your throwing arm. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good throw. Hi, thanks for your presentation. So you mentioned that for AO, you get very high compression ratios and you're not sure whether you would get the same for GI. Yeah. What kind of compression ratios are we looking at? I, I'm sorry, could you repeat? I didn't uh, quite. Um, what type of compression ratio do you get with AO? That you, because you mentioned you might not be able to get it with AO, GI. Uh, I, th I think I don't remember on top of my head, but I was at least somewhere between 5 and 10x compared to like sending it just raw. Like most of the compression ratio that we get is just by quantizing the things such that you don't actually see it. And there's like an additional 2 to 3x when you use uh, like LZ4 or C standard. So you end up with somewhere between 5 to 10x. 
Um, yeah, especially like the AO values, you don't if you have so many points, you don't really notice the differences between all of these, so you could go even lower. And that actually could also apply to GI. So if you have a ton of points that makes like your overall dense, like your overall contribution of each point lower, so it's kind of a trade-off between how many points you have and how large each point is going to get. But I assume for GI it's going to be a bit lower, but you could still kind of compress it as efficiently such that it is comparable to like a texture space representation. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's save my great question for the, the coffee break and move on to our next speaker. Let's thank our speaker. <laughs>